We're starting the third essay today. It's on page 261 in the Kuzari. Um, and I want us to, to just get our bearings to find out we're, we're jumping in in the middle of a sort of a, a topic that has not yet been visited before, which is the rabbi said, here is our conception of a servant of God. Meaning that what Rabbi Yehuda Levi is about to describe at the beginning of a totally new chapter or to totally new section of the Kuzari is to describe what it means to be an Eved Hashem, what it means to be a servant of Hashem. And so what is the context? Why is he introducing this topic over here? If you remember uh, two weeks ago when we finished the second essay, um, at the very end of the second essay in paragraph 81 on the previous page, he says, uh, uh, this suffices to endear the language to me. I will now ask you to explain to me your portrayal of a servant of God. So it's the, the Khazar king who's initiating this question. I want you to help me understand what a servant of God is. Now, why should that come up now? Why is that his curiosity? So if you recall... Part of, I mean, really what we've been leading up to up until this point is a discussion of why the Jewish faith is the superior faith. Why it makes sense that, uh, to be Jewish. Why Judaism is the authentic, real religion better than philosophy, better than Christianity, better than Islam. And everything that the rabbi has presented up until this point, provides historical basis, provides theological basis, provides, um, um, you know, the, uh, the arguments as to why it's plausible to believe in Maimed Har Sinai and the events that happened at Har Sinai, and the beauty of the Torah, and the intricacy and the scientific knowledge that the rabbis had based upon a very rich tradition that was handed to us from Hashem at Sinai. So all of these things are very impressive. But there's only one thing that's missing from all of this, which is, you know, the proof is in the pudding. It's almost like, you know, when parents come to me and they ask me, which school should I send my child to? So the answer to that question is not to look at the brochure of the school. The answer is not to look at the quality of teachers. The answer is not to look at the beautiful campus or to look at how much tuition is and all of the different departments and extracurricular activities that are being offered. What's the most important thing to look at? The boy or the girl. Why'd you say boy? Why'd you say girl? <laughs> well, <laughs> you must have boys. No, because when we were deciding where to send our son for high school, somebody gave me that advice and said, look at the boys that turn out from each school and think to yourself, would you, would you want your exactly. son to turn out like that or exactly. like that? Look at the product. Look at what the yeshiva or the seminary turns out. Look at what they're producing. So none of, and nothing else really matters. Yes? And so um, what... The Khazar king wants to know is, okay, so what kind of product are you Jews producing? I believe in the authenticity of the Torah. Your history is very convincing. The revelation at Sinai, all of that is great, but what is the product that you're producing? What is a Jew, in your opinion, the perfect Jew, what does he look like? What does he, what does he appear like? And, and if you recall, we're going to revisit some of the things that we had seen previously in the second essay when the Khazar king had also you know, said, I see all of these different religionists from all different play parts of the world, and remember, he started comparing maybe the Jews aren't really the chosen people because I don't see them doing this or that. We're going to revisit that as well when we open up in this first few paragraphs. So this is very, very important. Now remember, I had mentioned a couple of weeks ago that as far as the historicity of the third essay, it may actually have been written before the first two essays, at least according to um, Professor Yochanan Silman that we looked in his book a couple weeks ago, he had made that suggestion. 
But if we're going to look at this as a perfectly structured sequential text, it makes very good sense for the for Rabbi Yehuda Halevi to ask this question out, to present this idea. We've gotten all of the arguments. We've seen the brochure. Right? We, we, we're, we're sold on the on the um, you know on the sales package on Judaism, but the proof is in the pudding. Let's take a look now at the, what we're supposed to expect to see in a perfect, mm -hmm. in a, a servant of Hashem. So that's where we are over here. So let's see what he says. So the servant of God is not cut off from this world. That way of life would become a burden and cause one to despise living when life is really full of God's goodness. Okay, so the very first thing that Rabbi Huda Levi wants to clarify for the Khazar king is, do not associate religion with asceticism. Do not associate piety and service of God with self-deprivation. That is not a correct corollary to make, even though it is done by so many other faiths. Those who abstain, those who flagellate themselves, are considered to be more pious. But that is not our conception of a true servant of Hashem. Now, of course, this is a controversial statement because there are uh, references in many svarim, especially written in the medieval period, that talk about the virtues of prishut. The term prishut, prishus, of self-deprivation, asceticism, and that was a very common theme among all religions, especially in the medieval age. And so if you look at uh, the Sefer Orchos Tzadikim, which is a classic Musr Sefer that so many of us study in yeshiva and seminary, he's got a whole chapter called Shar Haprishus about the virtues of asceticism, of deprivation, of depriving yourself, you know? So I won't have that piece of chocolate cake for dessert. And that's actually a virtue if I do it for the sake of disciplining myself for the sake of service to Hashem. But for Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, that's not, where it's, that's not what it's about. Hashem wants us to enjoy life. Now, we have to, of course, we have to explain this very, very carefully because a life of indulgence clearly self it's self-evident to all of us in this room that a life of indulgence is clearly not where holiness is at. So we associate holiness with a certain sense of withdrawal from the physical world, but at the same time we are told that it is only via the physical world that we can actually attain our closeness and service to Hashem. It is a paradox, um, almost, but it is indicative of a tension that exists within Judaism that, for some, remains completely unresolved. And tensions are unresolved in life. The whole idea of Judaism being a, a religion that commands us to both love and fear God is an unresolved tension. Do you understand how the fear is I recoil from, love is I run towards, unresolved tension. Life is filled with unresolved tensions. That's what the human experience is all about. Part of the unresolved tension of our um, relationship with the physical world is, I must use it in order to reach closeness to God, but I cannot indulge in it because it will cause me to become further away from Hashem. So what's the balance? And so we're, gonna, we're going to explore this idea further. But before we do that, and I'm not even sure whether we'll have a chance to get into our text today, and if not, we'll recollect the sheets. I want us to refer back to the second essay. I believe it's paragraph 45. Page 206. Okay, the Kuzari said, um, 
you have commented and analogized amply on this subject of the Jewish people being the chosen people. But if you are truly the elite of all people, one would expect to see more people in your ranks serving God through asceticism than in any other <coughs> religion. So we already see that this idea was addressed by Rabbi Yehuda Levi before by putting words in the king's mouth of saying that as a person outside of Judaism, my association between godly service and, and this world is you have to withdraw from the world in order to serve God properly. So the, what is the rabbi's response? The rabbi said, I am pained by the fact that you have forgotten what I explained earlier, to which you also agreed. Did we not agree that one cannot become close to Hashem except through the commandments of God? Do you now think that closeness comes simply through humility, lowliness, and the like? And what are the commandments of God? The commandments of God are not humility, lowliness, and withdrawal from the world. I can only fulfill the mitzvos if I'm fully engaged in this world. I can only build a sukkah if I own a piece of property. If I don't own property, I can't build a sukkah. I can only fulfill the mitzvot of Pesach if I have matzah on my table and if I have the finery of a su'uda for Shabbos and Yom Tov. So how can I possibly fulfill the mitzvahs through a life of asceticism? And so the Kuzari is very confused. The Khazar king is very confused. And in paragraph 47, he says, yes, well, when coupled with righteous conduct, yes. And it even says, walk, you know, what does God request of you to do justice and love truth and walk humbly, except to do justice and love truth and walk humbly with your God? So Rabbi Yehuda Halevi uh, explains that there must be law. Let me just see where he gets to the... Uh, uh, just, just, just give me one. Just give me one second, and I'll take your question. Um, if, if you, if you still turn to page two hundred nine, he says that the prophet Sephania, when he was saying, "What does God want of you?" Oh, I'm sorry. Was it uh, Micha? Sorry. What is the prophet, when the prophet Micha says, walk humbly with the Lord your God, he's not saying that that's the exclusive activity that you're supposed to do, but rather he was criticizing the people saying that if you're only going to do the physical mitzvahs and they're devoid of feeling, they're devoid of humility, they're devoid of integrity, uh, of character, so then they're worthless. And therefore he says at the end of, of paragraph 48, he says this must be the correct interpretation. For is it possible that a Jew can uphold justice and love truth alone while abandoning circumcision, Shabbos, the laws of Pesach, and so forth, and still be spiritually successful? And to which the Kuzari said, no, you're <coughs> right. There must be some value in physical observance. And therefore, on page 210, the rabbi says, that being the case, asceticism is of no value. For the Torah has not charged us with this type of service. Rather, we are bidden to take the moderate path to equi equitably provide for every faculty within our body and soul its due portion, provided we avoid excess. For being excessive with one faculty results in curtailing another. For example, one who overindulges his physical desires will compromise his mental faculties and vice versa, and one who is overly ambitious will lose in other traits. And therefore, skip the next paragraph, this is the general rule then, is that our Torah's laws are split between those which arouse awe and those which arouse love and joy. You are therefore meant to become close to your God with both types. Your submissiveness during fast days will not bring you any closer than your joy on Shabbos and Yom and Tovim, provided that your joy is properly directed and is expressed with a full heart. And that essentially is the approach of Rabbi Yehud Halevi and the Kuzari, a life of moderation, the, the, the purpose of the mitzvot, was to allow the human being to utilize every single aspect of his or her humanity in order to serve Hashem. So I serve Hashem through, with fear through depriving myself on fast days, but I also serve Hashem with joy by indulging in my Shabbos meal. But anything to an excess, says Rabbi Yehuda Levi, is counterproductive. 
If I over abstain, that's unhealthy, and I won't be able to focus and concentrate and think properly, and I won't be able to enjoy life. And therefore, if I don't enjoy my life, then how can I thank God for giving me a beautiful life? And if I overindulge in the physical, then how can I possibly feel that sense of holiness and removal and ascension and transcendence that a Jew is called upon to have from the mundane? So everything has to be properly balanced. The fact that Hashem created us as a hybrid of both body and soul means that he expects us to use both body and soul in the service of God. Okay, one second. We had some questions? I think you answered already. <laughs> I was okay. thinking more about like the Kohen Gadol when he goes into the Kodesh HaKadoshim to speak with Hashem, right? Yes. In mm -hmm. Yom Kippur. Right. So it seems pretty like aseptic, but I guess that's just one part of his service, right? And it's one aspect of yeah, the service. And then there are Karbanot as well that he brings yeah. as well. He has to use the blood of the sacrifice. Yes. What about the essence that lived, uh, you know, in ancient times and they removed themselves we can't, we can't speak for the Essenes because they're not considered to be part of rabbin, the rabbinic Judaism that Rabbi Yehuda Levi is describing. It's perhaps for that very reason that the very next discussion that we're going to have in this third essay is about the Karaim, the Karaites. Karaites were known for their asceticism in certain areas of life. And that's perhaps why Rabbi Yehuda Levi is going to be discussing them shortly. But essentially, this is the foundation that he is revisiting over here. What is the per proper servant of God? This is not, in, in this essay, he's not sort of defending the service of God from the detractor in the, in the second essay, the king. But rather, he's saying this is the optimal way of serving Hashem. So let us continue this text. God himself cites a good life as a reward which he gives to the righteous, as it says. I will make the number of your days complete, and you will have long life. And if indeed we were meant to live a life of deprivation, and our goal was to be able to get in and out of this world and remove ourselves from life as much as possible, why would Hashem reward us by saying, I'll give you so much blessing in this world? We say in the Vahayayim Shamoa, the second paragraph of Shema every day, you'll eat and you'll be satisfied. So all of these blessings relate to how God says, I want you to have a good life. I want you to enjoy life. I want you to indulge in the blessings that I have provided for you. So the servant of God loves this world and long life because through them he acquires the world to come. So the servant of God recognizes that this is a means to a greater end, but at the same time, he must use the means in a joyful way in order to be able to get to the world to come. With every extra good deed that a person does in this world, he will acquire a higher level in the world to come. So therefore, if I don't, like Olam Hazad Domel Prosdor, right, as I quote for you in the Mishnah in Pirkei Avos, this world is like a corridor to the world to come. So what do we mean that this world is a corridor to the world to come? This is a statement from Rabbi Yaakov. He said that it is a necessary prerequisite to go through this world. Because you cannot get olam haba until you go through this world and live life in the proper way. So a person is supposed to enjoy life, indulge in this life, use it in the service of Hashem, in order to be able to merit to have the world to come. And this is really where I want to cite for you the other teachings of Rabbi Yaakov in, Mishnah, in the Mission in Pirkei Avos. Because Rabbi Yaakov's teachings are so important for an understanding of this very, very delicate balance that we are discussing now in the Kuzari. So the first thing he said, Rabbi Yaakov Omer, Olam Hazed Omer Prozdor Bifnei Olam Haba. He said, this world is like a corridor to the next world. You have to get through the corridor and not only get through it, but prepare yourself properly, live a virtuous life in the corridor, and relish that period in the corridor because through that life in the corridor, you will so that you will get into the grand ballroom of the world to come. Now, let's look at the next teaching of Rabbi Yaakov, which is 
in your sheets that I passed out for you today. Hu haya omer. Rabbi Yaakov used to say, Yafesh ha'a echat b'tshuva u'ma'asim tovim ba'olam hazeh, mikol chayei olam haba. He said, one moment of tshuva and good deeds in this world, one moment of living in this world, doing tshuva and good deeds, is greater than an eternity of olam haba. Is greater than an eternity of olam haba. And then let's look at his next statement. But one moment of satisfaction in the world to come is greater than a lifetime in this world. Now at face value, Rabbi Yaakov seems to be contradicting himself. He says one moment in this world of tshuv and ma'asim tovim is greater than an eternity of olam haba. And yet, one moment in Olam Abba is greater than anything that you can possibly accomplish in this world. So which one is it? Is a moment in this world better than the eternity of Olam Abba? Or is a moment in Olam Abba better than an entire lifetime in this world? How do we reconcile it? What's the reconciliation? Anybody? Go ahead. Because when you have free will in this world, it allows you to kind of purchase so much in the next world. So on the one hand, a moment of tshuva in this world is worth so much because it gets you so much in Olam Haba, but once you're in Olam Haba, it's way more than anything in this world. No? No, yeah, you're on the right track. Let me, let me just refine it a little bit because... <laughs> Because I may have I may have had a little bit more time to think about it. I just I put you on the spot, but you're but you're definitely saying good. The the prophet in Zechariah describes the difference between human beings and angels. Human beings are standing. I mean, sorry, angels are standing in, in their place, and human beings are mahalachim. They are walking. They are moving. They are in motion. The only place where we have the ability to grow and to advance through the efforts of our own free will is in this world. Once we pass away, we no longer have that opportunity to struggle and to strive for goodness. We've already reached the finish line. It's already too late for us to struggle further. And it is in that sense that even a moment in this world is better than the eternity of the world to come because of the great satisfaction that goes into the struggle for goodness, the struggle for virtue. And that's what Rabbi Yaakov at face value means when he says one moment in this, in this world is better than an eternity in the world to come because you can no longer strive in the next world. But if you're looking for pleasure, if you're looking to... Um, to sit on the beach and just experience the machaya of this world, the, the glory, the beauty, the aesthetics, the pleasures of this world. So then the pleasure that one has of basking in the divine presence in the next world far outweighs any pleasure that is attainable in this world. And therefore, when looked at it in that sense, it's not a contradiction, but we have to go a little bit deeper than that. It turns out that if you're really striving and struggling in your spiritual efforts in this world, you're really living a life of the world to come in this world. That's why Shabbos is called Me'ein Olam Haba. It's a semblance of the world to come. Because Shabbos is a time when we are supposed to be striving to elevate ourselves and to constantly reach higher to connect with Hashem. But it's not just Shabbos, it's any time when a human being strives for greatness, strives for virtue, strives for closeness to Hashem, they are experiencing whatever sublime pleasure that a person can achieve through that, sa that satisfaction that is a semblance of the world to come. The, the, the joy in enjoying the fruits of one's labor. 
But here's where I think that we need to go a little bit deeper. There is a very, very profound few lines that I, I first learned about when I learned Rav Dessler's Mikhtav Me'eliyahu. And he quotes a, a Hasidish Sefer called Pri Haaretz from Rabbi Menachem Mendel Mivitevsk, Vitevsk, I think I'm pronouncing it right. And he tells us as follows, and this is part of his Torah commentary, and I think maybe perhaps we'll only get a chance to start it today, and then perhaps uh, we'll, after looking at his questions or looking at the intro, we'll try to continue this next week. He says, Uve emet she'ein shum, it's, you have it on your sheets. He says, Uve emet she'ein shum hasaga maseges v'tofeses hadveikut ha'amiti be'ein sof b'shum seichel kol she'kein v'hargasha v'ta'anu. Very, very difficult words, but what he's trying to communicate is as follows. It is virtually impossible, he says, to feel either on an intellectual or emotional level, devekut. What does the term devekut mean? Connection, conjunction, attachment to the divine. How do you know if you're really close with God? I've had this so many times. Where per, a Jew, when I was more involved in, um, in outreach in my earlier days, you know, sometimes a person would say to me, God and I are very close. I don't, you know, I don't need to be an Orthodox Jew. God and I have a very close relationship. And that's wonderful that you feel that way. But how does anyone really know their level of closeness to Hashem? How can anyone possibly feel that sense of Dvekus? And Listen to what a holy Hasidic master says. He says, no one is capable of experiencing through any human outlet whether or not they are close with Hashem or not. He says you can't experience it on an intellectual level. You cannot experience it on an emotional level. Memela muvan shekol hargashat ha'yira o ahava o ta'anuk hadvekus v'hargashas in yanei kol adam kozei. He says, it turns out that any kind of sense of fear or awe of God that you feel at a moment, or any sense of love that you feel for God, or any sense of closeness with Hashem that you may feel, or any other kind of human experience where you relate to the divine on some level, really is artificial, is false. And that's a very scary prospect. Kilo birash Hashem. Because God, as he told Elijah the prophet on, Mount, uh, uh, on the Mount, uh, Mount Horeb, he said to him, God is not in the loud noise. God is not audible. God is not visible. God is, there's no visceral reaction when you feel God. You can't feel God. Aval hadvekut amiti achar hamurgashu hasheinu murgash b'shum tfisa. What is true attachment to God? It is something that transcends sensation. And it is something that, by its definition, cannot be felt or sensed. It, by its very, by very virtue of the fact that it is so lofty and divine, you cannot detect it. Just like you cannot detect God, you cannot see God, you cannot feel God, you cannot feel that devekut, that connection with God. So that's depressing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you've ever felt the Vekut, to be told that it's artificial. But it's also reassuring if you've never felt the Vekut. <laughs> <laughs> because maybe it means that you really, you and God are really, really close. You just don't know it. So I'm going to leave you here at this cliffhanger. <laughs> I'm going to leave you here at this cliffhanger, and then we're going to finish this and find out. So what, so what Taka? What talk is the answer? If I can't feel it, I can't sense it, I can't know it, then what am I supposed to be doing? And how am I supposed to gauge my service? How am I supposed to gauge whether or not I'm doing, I'm on the right track to be continued? Um,
Maybe I'll ask someone to collect these sheets. Just just uh, put them on this table over here, and we'll pass them out next time. Oh, but I wrote on mine. What? I wrote on mine. That's okay. You want to keep it? I'll have, I have yeah, enough. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Take it back. Okay, someone collect the sheets and then just put them on the table and we'll pick it up in Mirza Shem next time. I want us to spend the remaining time that we have to talk a little bit about Purim. Koseev is lo- uh, 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 deceiving, deceptive. Koseev. To be mechazev is to lie or to tell a fib. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. It's you'll, your hangover will be over by then. <laughs> the is on Sunday. Yes. When you look at your life, like how it makes sense in your own journey, like don't don't you see God in everything? Like not everybody feels that way, but I mean I can. You can find God everywhere, but that's that's different. That's that, that's we're not talking about finding God in the world. We're talking about sensing your level of closeness to God, and and the sense of awe or love that you feel. Is it real? Is it unreal? Is it really just a a human construct? And it's really okay.